Good morning. Good morning. Are you awake out there? I know about you, but it was kind of a sleepy morning for me too. Happy Epiphany. This is the Sunday that the church traditionally commemorates and celebrates the arrival of the wise men, two years after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and uh, to come and to worship and lay their gifts before the Christ child. And we read in Matthew chapter 2 about the visit of the wise men. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the whole wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, and they were saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over the place where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Would you stand with us? Let's worship the Messiah and the King that the wise men came to this worship as well. Mm -hmm.
everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah that was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, to come to show us what the Father was truly like. He is the everlasting God, the maker and the creator and sustainer of all things. Let's lift him up this morning.
Join the Lord together today, shall we? Lord Jesus, we come to you on this wonderful day, a day of worship, a day to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ, to gather in your name and have your spirit fill us once again anew as we lift you up and worship you, our Messiah, the Christ, our everlasting Father, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd that leads us through all things as we go on this journey of life. And Lord, we are so thankful that as we look into a new year that is before us, Lord, we know we have amazing things in store. Lord Jesus, we pray that you walk closely with us day by day, and we drop closer to you. And if we walk through valleys, we walk through canyons, Lord, be with us. Help us not to fear, because you are with us. And if we go to the mountain peaks, and we see glimpses of your glory, help us to always remember that you love us, and that you're bringing us home. We just thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity to raise you up, and to adore you, and to worship you, as our spirits fall down before you, and give you all the glory and the praise. We just pray, Lord Jesus, even now, your spirit would fill this place and you fall on us in a powerful way. Anoint Pastor Brian as he brings your message to us today, Lord, as we look at this new year of promise, of breakthrough, of opportunities for transformational change as we seek your face. Lord Jesus, show us, lead us, guide us. May we walk in your will. May we ever be before you. We pray all these things in your blessed and perfect name. Amen. Oh, 
praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. It's because our giving is making a difference far beyond the four walls of this place. It's making a difference generationally and geographically at the exact same time. And so we just want to share that with you today as a, a time of celebration. Also, uh, today starts our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And um, I'm thrilled for this. Uh, and, and, and if I'm honest with you, though, too, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous for this because I'm just dumb enough to believe what God is going to be saying to us. I'm just dumb enough to believe that the new wine and the new wine skins that God wants to pour out on us and transform us into is something he really can and will do. And I don't know what that looks like. That makes it scary, doesn't it? That, that means we have to let go of control of things and completely surrender and submit to him. And, and that's 
well, brings about anxieties and fears and questions and maybe even some doubts here and there. But that's precisely why we make this an intentional effort as we start off the year. Uh, it's 21 days of prayer and fasting. Last year was the first year we began to do this. And, um, and just as your pastor, I just want to just very quickly share my heart and say, it is my hope that this 21 days becomes a part of our culture and, and our life cycle and, and, and who we are and what we do for many, many years to come. I believe it really is the transforming work that God wants to do in us. And I also believe it's the way that God does a transforming work in us. And so um, I'm going to share a few things with you today before we get into the whole new wine and new wine skins and, and that text. I think we, we um, if we're honest, we're, we're not uh, very familiar with fasting in our culture. Uh, in our lives and, 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 and especially in our churches. And so uh, if you were with us last year, you're going to hear a little bit of what you heard last year. Um, we kind of just blew some dust off of the notes uh, from last year because we want to recap at least a little bit of what fasting really is, what it's not, what it looks like, etc., etc., so that we have a solid foundation on which to stand. So for my note takers, you are my favorite people in the world. Uh, some of you, uh, the rest of you, we still love you too. We just like the other ones better. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really am. But uh, for my note takers, you may find, hey, this some of this is ringing a bell to me, or you flip back in a, in a previous notebook, you may find some of this again. But I'm also adding to this this year to take it to the next level. We're not going to stay in the basement forever, but as, as a culture and as a people, we don't really talk much about fasting, even though Scripture talks about it plenty. And so it's still new for us. And we're going to approach it that way as we begin. Uh, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6, uh, and starting at verse 16. Matthew chapter 6 today. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. And, and these, are, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus is the one talking here. And he starts by saying, when you fast. And just last night as I was looking at this text, I, I just could not get past those opening words. That, that so easily, we as the church just kind of blow past. Now, is Jesus making fasting a commandment? No, but he certainly is making the assumption and the implication that we will fast, right? So it's not if you fast, but when you fast. And he says, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces, to show all of the others that they're miserable and fasting. Okay? Jesus goes and says, Truly I tell you, they receive their reward in full. And what Jesus means by that is they wanted the attention of the people. They wanted everybody to know just how holy and righteous they were. And so they made it obvious that they were doing this thing called fasting. And Jesus says they got the reward because they got all the attention that they were desiring. But they missed the important piece. But when you fast, Jesus says, once again, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So again, fasting, as we talk about this, this is not a, a command, but it is all throughout the pages of Scripture, a spiritual discipline that God calls people to engage in, and when people engage in it in a true and holy and meaningful way, the way that God designed for it to be, he shows up, does a new thing in your life, does a new thing in your city, does a new thing amongst his people, and rewards are great. Now, don't misunderstand me today. I'm not up here preaching some health and 
wealth gospel that if we do 21 days, we're all going to be loaded and never be sick again. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I don't believe all of God's rewards are tangible in this life, even as we, as we think of what a reward would be. But our reward of being that much closer to the one we call Lord, that, my friends, is good enough. Amen? All right, so again, it's not a command, but it is implied that we, as God's people, participate in the spiritual discipline of fasting. But what is fasting? I think for, for many of us, we've heard the word, um, but we're kind of new to it. And if you are, um, I would say, if you are under the age of, uh, of 40-ish, uh, you're probably on Instagram, and so you see every single uh, influencer who is involved in weight loss, who is involved in working out, who is involved in any kind of health and fitness uh, piece of life, they are always talking about fasting, especially intermittent fasting, as it's referred to, right? Where uh, you know you go, you have your your dinner at seven o'clock, but you don't eat again until say two or three, or sometimes even later, depending on what you're doing. So we're familiar with maybe the term, but. But what does the Bible say fasting is? Because there is a difference between a fast and, in fact, uh, those of uh, ladies who have gone through pregnancy, uh, many of you have had to do a fast in order to drink the, the orange sugary drink. You know, am I, did I just like, everybody just stared at me like, They've never heard what I'm speaking of before, and I thought maybe I was really wrong, right? The, the orange sugary drink that to, to check, uh, to see if you're going to be diabetic and all this stuff, so you have to fast for a period of time beforehand, right? We're familiar with that term, but I think there's a difference between fasting and biblical fasting. And so let's talk about this very briefly here, some definitions for us as we move on, all right? So one definition of a biblical fast is a voluntary withdrawing from food and or drink or other fleshly appetite for a specified period of time. Now leave that up there for just a second for me, Marshall. I, I, I think this is a, a decent definition. And if I'm honest, it feels very sterile. Um, and and it uh, has the, 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 the feeling to it that it came right out of a dictionary. Right? I do love that they talk about food and or drink. They also mention, however, this thing of other fleshly appetite. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but I want to remind us as we go on, as we talk about biblical fasting, it's always involving food and or drink. Okay? We can fast from other things. We can fast from social media. We can, we can fast from a, a sexual relationship with our spouse. We can fast from those things. And, and those things are good. And they don't disqualify. They're, they're not unworthy of a biblical fast. But a biblical fast will always involve food and or drink as a key piece of its component. Let's go on to the next one here. Uh, Jensen Franklin, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Tony Evans, he, he defines fasting this way. He says, fasting is giving up a craving in the physical for a need in the spiritual. Now, I love that definition. He doesn't highlight what we're fasting with or from necessarily other than this physical craving. And I think that's a key thing for us to understand. Fasting is hard because we have physical cravings. And oftentimes it's, it's, it's in the midst of, of taming, if you will, these physical cravings. It's, it, it, it's when God brings about a, a new level of self-control in our lives that we actually do encounter Him to a greater and deeper level because our physical cravings are taking His place so many times. But the need for us is spiritual. You see, um, if, if you're like me, and you have a hard time passing up anything in an orange wrapper that says Reese's on it, some of you won't look me in the face, and others are just nodding right now. I get it, right? But if you have a hard time with that, that's not an addiction to sugar. 
It is, but it's deeper than that. You see, that there, there's something else deep inside us that brings us to that place where we say we are addicted, where we are stuck in a rut, where we continue to turn to the same things over and over and over again, even when we know we shouldn't, even when we know it's not good for us, even when we know it's, it's a good thing, but that we've taken it to excess. Right? And so that's why I love this definition from Dr. Tony Evans. And then Jensen Franklin, in his book on fasting, I, this is the sweetest and shortest thing I could find. Biblical fasting is re, uh, refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Okay? That really is the crux of what we're talking about. Right? And so as we take all of that and come to this place of understanding, this is what we mean when we are talking about fasting. So as we leave this place today, because we're going to put a time on this, so we technically start at noon, right? That way, when we come back together on the 28th, when this worship gathering is all over, we celebrate together at noon. I'm just saying there might be a donut in the lobby <laughs> on the 28th, right? As we, I'm just saying, right? We're going to celebrate that. But at noon is when we start, and, and, and we're embarking on this together at this time. So between now and then, and even in the days to come, don't feel a pressure to go, oh my gosh, I don't think I have this all figured out. It's all right. Spend time with the Lord, but really spend time with Him in this understanding of what we're talking about with fasting, right? What food and or drink, and maybe other things too, but what food and or drink might fasting look like for you as you uh, move forward in this time of 21 days of prayer and fasting? So there's three kinds of, of fasts um, in the grand scheme of things. The first one is a normal fast, right? This is where we would give up uh, a period of time with no food. Okay, that period of time, it could be a day, it could be three days, it could be 21 days, it could even be 40 days. But there's a period of time with no food. Now, now you may have water, and you may have some juices uh, during that time of a normal fast, but it's food that is gone for a period of time in a normal fast, right? Water especially is so incredibly important uh, during a fast. Um, I would even encourage you, we, we have a guide uh, that we're going to give to you at the end of our gathering today that has more detailed information in it, but even juices can be difficult uh, in, in a fast, uh, so use that with caution. We're not, we're not medical professionals, we're not giving you that kind of advice, but just trying to paint a picture for you. So a normal fast is a period of time with no food, even though water and maybe even juices are consumed. Then there's the partial fast. Uh, I know uh, Jennifer uh, grew up um, and had a, a Catholic family. And so on Fridays at that time, there was no meat, right? That's a partial fast. There's a period of time that you are choosing to say, I'm not going to eat or consume specific things, right? Uh, maybe for you, one of the things that God's going to lead you to fast from during this 21 days is the sugar and the sweets, you know, and that kind of a thing. And that you're going to fast from that partial as a partial fast, all right? And the thing I love about a partial fast is it allows everybody to participate in some way, okay? fully understand there are people uh, in this room, there are people in our live stream, there are people who just couldn't be here today, but people who are dealing with legit medical issues and ought not just embark on a 21 day water fast with all the other things you've got going on, right? Talk to your doctor before you start that journey, right? But a partial fast means everybody can participate at some level. And then there's what's called the absolute fast. This is no food, no liquid, for a period of time. Now Jesus did this for 40 days in the wilderness when he was being tempted by Satan. I, I say this uh, lovingly and I say it carefully, but you and I are not Jesus. 
okay? In order to make a period of time of 40 days with no food and no water truly is a miracle and requires divine intervention, okay? So I'm not encouraging anyone. I want that on the record. I want that on YouTube. I'm not saying that we should embark on 40 days of no food and no water. However, I do believe we can go for periods of time, maybe a short period of time where you could go a day on an absolute fast, right? Now, it's a short period of time, but it's absolute because <coughs> literally nothing being consumed, right? So there's a little bit of what some types of fasts are. Now, here's what fasting is not. Okay, let's, let's start there. What fasting is not. Fasting is not a self-righteous act. We are not engaging in 21 days of prayer and fasting in order to show this city just how holy we really are. And that we are better Christians than the other Christians down the street. Okay, that's not what this is at all. See, the, the, the leaders that Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 6, they were moaning and groaning all about and suffering out loud, if you will, uh, just verbally and physically, their body language, all of it. They were communicating to everybody, please look at us and look how much we love God. We are sacrificing and suffering because we are better than you. And that is not what we are doing when we participate in fasting. It's not a self-righteous act at all. It's a way for us to humble ourselves, right? It's not about us. It's about getting closer to Him, right? Also, fasting is not a diet, okay? For those, as we, again, we start the new year, and uh, Planet Fitness is still pretty full. Give it a couple more weeks, right? Then you, then you can go. Right, but but the, this idea of we are we are just overwhelmed in our culture with how can I lose a quick five, ten, fifteen hundred pounds? Right, like we we, we just want to get it all gone, and, and if there's somebody that shows up with a new way to do it, we'll try it. If you just if you doubt me, stay up really late and watch what kind of infomercials come on television. Right. And, and so this is not the Jesus version of Weight Watchers, right? It's not that at all. Might there be, dependent upon your fast, might you shed a pound or two or maybe some more? Absolutely. But that's not why we're doing this, okay? And, and I promise you that if that's what your goal is, you're going to get it all back anyway. And probably a couple more pounds on top of it. Right? And you will, you will also get your reward. Like Jesus said, the scale will tell you this magical number that you've been longing for. And then you begin to go right back to what you were doing. You felt really good about it all the while missing the time with them. So it's not a diet. All right? Fasting is also not punishment for sin. This is not God's people coming together and trying to uh, pay a penance for the sin in our life. Jesus already did that for us. Amen? That's why the cross is so beautiful. And we, we don't have one here just so we can put stained glass in it and make it pretty. That's not why we have that here. We have that here because that reminds us what Jesus Christ has done for us. This sets us free. <laughs> this lets us know that we can come, that we can receive forgiveness. Right? And so this is not about punishment for sin. We don't have to put ourselves through a level of pain and suffering in order to, to take our lashes, if you will, for the sin in our lives. Now, don't misunderstand me. Fasting can be a part of our repentance. Okay? I do believe that with all of my heart. I think when, when we truly come to the place where we see our sin the way God sees sin, and it breaks our heart like it breaks His, I do believe we can enter into a time of fasting that is us not beating ourselves up for the sin, but being even more thankful for the forgiveness of sin and developing a closer relationship with the one who forgives us. 
So I do believe that is a key piece of it, but do not think we're just beating ourselves up because we think poorly of ourselves for our sin. We are a child of the Most High God. Amen? Amen. All right, here's, here's the other thing. This uh, Fasting is not coercion of God. We're not twisting God's arm and looking him in the eyes and going, all right, God, we're going to do this for 21 days. And on day 22, these are the things we had better see. These are the things that we demand of you. Because we are going to do this to twist your arm to get you to do that. That's not how this works um, at all. Again, we're trying to grow closer to Christ. We're trying to, to uh, be strengthened by him. And we understand that Jesus Christ is not a genie who grants us wishes at the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Right. See, if, if we're honest with each other, um, I, I think, and I think even as the church, not just this one, the church, I think we often paint this picture as we try to encourage people to to come to Christ for forgiveness of sin and for salvation. I think we focus way too much on the things that we get. Right? We, we talk all the time about the things we get. If, if you, you get this forgiveness, but you get heaven, which is streets of gold, and no pain, and no suffering, and, and you get all these things. Church, can I just tell you, we only need one thing, and his name is Jesus. And if we didn't get anything else, Jesus Christ is enough. All by himself. Right? Jesus is enough. Even if we receive nothing else else. Okay, so we're not doing all of this to get something from him. He has already given himself to us. We just want more of him and him alone, right? So what is fasting then? Fasting is a time of earnest prayer because the old saying goes that you can pray without fasting, but you cannot fast without prayer. Can I say that one more time so you can grab that? You can pray without fasting. In fact, we, we've already experienced that. Nicole prayed, and we gathered together corporately in that prayer. We can pray without fasting, but we cannot fast without prayer. That's just called a hunger strike. right? That's just sitting on the couch and being miserable. Right? That's not what this is about. We pray. This is all about us getting rid of noise and distractions and everything else in order that we might have more of Jesus. And we have more of Jesus by coming to him in earnest and thankful and honest prayer, right? We come to Jesus in times of prayer. We give up those times of food and eating in order that we might spend more time with Jesus in his word and in prayer, right? We, when that hunger pain hits, and we think we're going to die. <laughs> we go to Jesus in prayer. Our prayer might start, oh Lord, please help me because I'm not sure I'm going to make it. But by the time we're done, we can be at that place where we understand we're in the presence of the Most High God. Who is our comforter. Who is our healer. Who is our strength. Who is our song. And we can spend time with Him in prayer. Fasting is not easy, and those of you that have participated in longer fasts, you know this. Um, there's commercials. I mean, Snickers does a great job with, with the hangry commercials, but you can have a new kind of hangry uh, on a fast, all right? And, and so it can make you irritable. Now, look at your spouse and say, I'm not using that as an excuse, right? Just own that now. Do not do that. Uh, and don't say Pastor Brian said it's okay either. Right? But here's the thing. We have, will experience irritability. What a perfect time to come to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, my attitude stinks. Help me. Lord, I'm getting grouchy and I can't seem to stop it. Help me. Right, Coming to him in prayer. It's a time of prayer. Right, When you see those commercials late at night because you're doing a fast and, uh, and then the Pizza Hut commercial is followed by the Burger King commercial which is, you, you know what I'm saying? They always start about 10 o'clock at night, by the way. Um, just so you know. I don't know how that happens, but it's a miracle. And it does, right? So when those things come on, and, and you start praying, 
you spend time with Jesus in prayer. Next thing you know, you've been praying a whole lot. And you've been praying for a whole lot more than deliverance from the commercial break on television, right? Second thing, fasting is humbling ourselves. It's humbling ourselves. In a fast, if there are things that we take pride in, they will be revealed <laughs> and hopefully stripped away. Right? That's what we want. Jesus is not saying, hey, fast so I can point out all your flaws and all your failures. No, he's saying, listen, there's still parts of your life that you have not completely surrendered to me. And I want to meet you right there and I want to transform that place in your life. And if you will just humble yourself, which fasting certainly is a time of humility. The things that control us, they're going to be revealed and hopefully stripped away. You know, for some of us, when we start talking about fasting, you've already got one thing in your mind that you've either said, I cannot fast from that. Or you've said, I'm not, I hope they don't ask me to fast from that. Right? There's that thing, right? I, I, can, I, can I just step in metal for a second? Somebody said, no, I'm going to keep going anyway. Because they don't have the microphone. No, I'm teasing. But uh, how many of us would say, man, I, I, think, I think the Lord is asking me to fast from coffee. And I'm, and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it. Or how many of us are going, I, I think the Lord's asking me to fast from coffee, and he must be out of his mind. Right? right? There's a difference between those two attitudes, right? Just as an example, pointing it out, right? Okay, and so if those things, those things control us, when we say, I can't get through the day without blank, hmm, maybe, just maybe those things have a place on the throne of our heart that they shouldn't, and it's the things we should be fasting from, all right? Um, and finally, uh, fasting is increasing our intimacy with God, okay? We are spending more and more and more time with Jesus because we're not being distracted by other things. We are looking for him to be our source of, of fulfillment in all things. We're turning to him when otherwise we would have turned to other sources. And so when we're fasting, it's a closer draw. And it's, 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 a, it's a, a tighter funnel, if you will, of pointing us and guiding us and directing us into the arms of Jesus, to sit at his feet, to sit at his lap, to hear his voice, to, for him to be our all in all, for him to be our absolute everything. And we have this time of intentionality to do that, right? We can't have intimacy with someone that we're not close to, that we're not spending time with. And that's what a 21 days of prayer and fasting is all about. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, okay, if scripture talks about fasting over and over and over and over and over again, and flat out talks about fasting, if you add the implications of fasting throughout the pages of scripture, it multiplies. Okay, so fasting is this huge thing for God's people all throughout the pages of Scripture. But the question is, why don't we fast? Why is that something that, that we have ignored? Why is that something that we haven't been taught? Why is that something that, that, that has not been in the life of the church uh, an, an intentional effort and, a, and an intentional spiritual discipline that we invest time and energy and efforts in to teach people about and to engage them in it and, and equip them to be able to do so. Well, in, in his book on revival, this pastor and author, his name is Dave Clayton, um, he wrote in this book that there are six barriers to fasting. Now, I'm sure there's more, uh, but he gave uh, six good ones, and I'm going to share those with you today, and we'll go through them very quickly. Why don't we fast? Because we have six potential barriers. The first one is a desire for self-sufficiency. Okay? That's us as people. We have a desire within us to be self-sufficient. We have a longing within us to be independent, 
to do things on our own, to do things our way, right? And so this desire for self-sufficiency, as long as that is in play, as long as that desire for self-sufficiency is reigning supreme in our life and we fail to submit to God, we are going to struggle with fasting. We're not even going to talk about fasting because this whole thing shreds the desire for self-sufficiency. Another barrier is hunger for worldly pleasures, right? We hunger after the things of this world like nobody's business. You know, we, we, like to, we like to blame the marketing companies and, and those who make the commercials and the products. And, and we say, it's their fault. Look what they did to us. They, they enticed us with all these things. And they made the commercials look right. And they made things smell exactly the way we dreamt that they would. And, and it's all their fault. But all those marketing people are doing is tapping into the depths of who we are. You see... The marketing works because there's a people for it to work on. See, so we hunger after these worldly pleasures. And until we begin to hunger more for the things of God than the things of this earth, we will struggle and ignore the discipline of fasting. We have a bent toward self-gratification. All right? We want what we want. And we want it now. I'm not trying to dog on Burger King, but they said, and they told me, since the time I was a little boy, that I could have it my way. Right? That was the whole thing. And I'm like, of course I can. I'm the king of the world. Make it my way. And if I don't get it my way, I'm going to turn into a Karen who makes it on a TikTok video and goes viral. Okay? You see, that that's just how it works. Because we want things our way. It's all about us. It's about our self-gratification. You know, I was thinking back when I was a little kid, my mom ordered this, like, Rubik's Cube thing for me. Uh, but it wasn't a legit Rubik's Cube because we were broke. So what it was was my mom had saved up all these, like, box tops from Chex cereal. So my Rubik's Cube had pictures of checks, squares, and blueberries, and all this other stuff. I remember the day she told me that she had enough, and she put it in the mail. And I was convinced as a child that Jesus was going to return before that Rubik's Cube showed up in my house, because it took forever. I mean, it had to have been months before this thing showed up in my house. Now, here I am at the age of 45, and my Amazon Prime 2K is not fast enough. Because I want what I want. And I want it right now. See, that's the world in which we live in. And until we understand that a call to follow Jesus is a call to die to ourselves, we're going to struggle with fasting. And we're going to ignore participating in spiritual discipline. Another barrier is humanism, right? And I know that we can go on forever about what humanism really is. But, but the best way to sum all of this up is just the fact that we view ourselves so incredibly high. That we don't even see that it's necessary to pay the cost of discipline for Jesus Christ. We I have put ourselves on such a high pedestal that the, when Jesus asks us to sacrifice, when Jesus asks us to submit, we look down upon him as if to say, how dare you try to dethrone me? Because it's all about me. Right? And as humans, we, we do this. We, we just elevate ourselves constantly so high. Another barrier is undisciplined living. Okay? If we are undisciplined in other areas of our lives, we are going to struggle to participate in a spiritual discipline of fasting. Or any spiritual discipline. 
for that matter, right? Jesus wants to develop commitment and follow through and, and perseverance in us as his people. But if our lives are just chaotic and falling apart and undisciplined all over the place, we will struggle with fasting. And then finally, the other barrier was a lack of vision. If we can't even imagine what it looks like in the end, then we certainly aren't going to participate at the beginning. If we don't see what God has in store for us, if we don't see the desires of his heart, if we don't see the heavenly places, if we don't see his heavenly blessings, if we don't see the transformation that not only that he wants to do in us, but that he can do in us, then we certainly aren't going to participate because we can't even imagine what the goal is. So we have to understand that we need to get into the word and ask the Lord. We sing the song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, in order that I might see you. Right? It's so important because we cannot lack vision if we want to truly engage in the spiritual discipline of fasting. So, now that we're all thoroughly depressed and beat up, ask ourselves this another question. Why would we fast then? Okay? Why would we do this? What would we get out of it? I hate to say it that way because it's not about us, but you get the idea, right? Well, what is this for? What happens if we were to do this? Why would we fast? And again, same author, Dave Clayton, he, he gives us seven breakthroughs to fasting. Seven breakthroughs. Here's the first one. A deeper friendship with God. In Psalm 42, verses 1 through 3, we sang this today. Right? I think go to the next slide for me. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Get this in verse 3. Fasting, right here. My tears have been my food. Day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? See, David could have cried out for a loaf of bread. David could have cried out for a great meal. But instead he said, Lord, I want you. Because if I have you, it will suffice. It will supply. It will, it will be everything that I need and more. And I don't desire all of these other things, Lord Jesus. I just want you. And so when we enter into a time of intentional prayer and fasting, we get to that place where we develop a deeper friendship with God. And so when we sing Psalm 42, the next time we sing it from a new place, we sing it not because the words are on the screen, but we sing it because it's coming from the depths of our very being. Oh, my soul. Hope in Jesus shall praise your God at last. Right? A deeper friendship with God. And the second thing is a renewed hunger for heavenly things. Forgive the typo. Go ahead and go to the next slide for me. Forget the typo. That is not Psalm 42. We just talked about that. It's Matthew chapter 5 and it's verse 6. Um, that is not Marshall's fault. That was my fault. I didn't get it fixed before I gave it to him. Um, but uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, this is the Beatitudes that Jesus is talking about. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Right? And so when we enter into a time of intentional prayer and fasting, we have a renewed hunger for the things of God. Right? And as that hunger is renewed, what we find is that we walk away from it blessed. That's what Jesus said. We're, we're blessed. And, 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 I, and I know that, the, that we can argue what the word blessed really means, but you know one of them means happy? Happy. What? You mean if, if I lay off the donuts and if I put time aside that I didn't think I had and I spend it with Jesus, I can actually walk away hungry for him and see what he sees and end up in this place where, where I'm happy about it all? 
because Jesus showed up and it was enough. And that guy was filled and didn't even miss the cake. Yeah. Yes, that's what we're trying to say. All right, here's the third breakthrough. Soul training for self-denial. Okay, Jesus said this in, in, in Mark chapter 8. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. So you see, with this for many of us a group in the church, this verse is, is so familiar because we, maybe even if we were kids, it was a Sunday school verse or a, a VBS verse and this kind of a thing. But don't miss this. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple." must pick up their instrument of torture and death and come with me down the road where we for sure will die. That's what Jesus is saying here. For whoever wants to save their life is going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. We should fast because it, it works to strengthen and grow our denial muscles. Okay? We get better, if you will, at, at, at dying to self the more we ask Jesus to walk with us as we die to self. Okay? And so that is, for if you find yourself in that place where you're just stuck and, and, and letting go of you is hard, then, then this is the breakthrough that you need, right? To engage in this time of prayer and fasting and, and be trained for this self-denial. Another breakthrough is intimacy, security, and strength. And I did not put all of this up because I love Marshall, who's back running screens today, and he has enough slides. Uh, but Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and there's just a lot of slides to put that up. Uh, but for my note takers, you can write that down. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. This is where Jesus, after being baptized by John the Baptist, where the Holy, when Jesus comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. And then we find Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. Okay? And Jesus is fasting, again, miraculously, for this time of 40 days. And all throughout that text, if you will go back and reread that this week, you will find that there was an intimacy that Jesus had with his heavenly Father because it was all he had. And that relationship was so incredibly close. And he was relying on and leaning on his Father in that time. There was a security there because Jesus knew that he was loved by his heavenly father. He just got the kudos as he came up out of the water with John the Baptist. His father said, this is my son. I just imagine that, saying that so proudly, right? This is my son and you're going to follow him and you're going to do what he says. Why would the father allow something to happen that should happen? There's security there. There's also strength there. Because in one of the things the devil tempted Jesus with, the devil knew he was hungry. And, and the devil says, you're Jesus. Just tell that rock to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So there was strength that was received in the midst of that fasting as well. Here's another one, another breakthrough. Clarity in prayer. Have, have you ever just wanted to go to God because you're really confused? And go, God, I, I'm coming to you in prayer and I desperately need an answer. I, I, and, I, and maybe you've been bold and you said, Jesus, I know you don't like to give answers. You like to ask more questions, but I need an answer. Right? I need clarity. I need to know what it is you want. I need to know what it is you're trying to say. I need to know what I should do. Right? And in Daniel chapter 10, again, I didn't put the whole thing up, but read uh, in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament chapter 10, Daniel's participating himself in a time of fasting where Daniel's not eating 
any meat of any kind from the king, and he's not drinking any of the king's wine. He's doing only vegetables, right? It's just broccoli and asparagus for old Daniel. And, 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 and by the time that fasting is all done, Daniel and his buddies ended up looking better than everybody else anyway. But in Daniel chapter 10, we see that Daniel is getting this vision. He's getting clarity to the prayers that have been prayed. And this is coming from a time or through a time of prayer and fasting. One more here we have is, uh, is that another potential breakthrough is humility for revival. Humility for revival. I'm telling you, church revival will not come until God's people are humbled. It doesn't matter who's speaking. It doesn't matter what the music's like. It doesn't matter how much money we spend. It doesn't matter at all until God's people humble themselves before him. That is the first step in revival. Check this out. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, we, we love this passage of scripture because it, it gives us all these great things, right? It gives us tons of great things. God's going to hear us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to heal the land. Woo, sign me up. Right? That, that, that's what we, what we want. Uh, but, but it also says that we got to pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. And we go, well, of, of course, we, we, we should do that. You're right. We, we should probably get a committee and figure out how we're going to go about doing that. Right. But Jesus, don't, don't forget, you're going to do the healing and all the stuff, right? Right? But what's the first thing to say? My people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You see, the prayer and the seeking, it doesn't come until the humility comes first. As long as we are full of ourselves, as long as we are putting ourselves in God's place, we will not come to him in prayer. Prayerlessness is not a time issue. It's a heart issue. God's people must be humble first. And for revival to come, we must experience humility. Final breakthrough. Freedom from demonic strongholds. Okay, freedom from demonic strongholds. Before I go any further, I don't want anybody freaking out. Um, I, 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 I'm not a person that believes every bad thing that happens on the earth or to someone means that someone has a demon. I, 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 don't, I don't see in scripture that that's how it works. But I do know that in John chapter 10, Jesus says that the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. How he chooses to go about that, I don't know. I don't really care. I just know that's his goal. Okay? And so as long as the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, then, then, then we're going to have to deal with the ramifications of his nonsense on this earth. And we are going to have to find a way to break through the strongholds and the bondage that he has put people in. So in, in uh, Mark chapter 8, I'm sorry, 9, uh, uh, they, when they come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? See, the disciples had been sent out, and, and, and they encountered a guy who was demon-possessed, and, and they were just following Jesus' orders. They were pretty confident that they understood all the lessons they had received up to that point. But when they got to this guy, it just wasn't working. And people were standing around going, what's wrong with you knuckleheads? I thought you were Jesus, guys. And, and, and it's just not working. And so Jesus says to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Okay? Now, caveat. Caveat. You may have noticed on the screen behind me, this text is different than all, from its source, is different from all the others. 
This text is from the New King James Version, not the NIV that we've been using uh, throughout uh, this sermon. Scholars, I'm going to let them keep arguing and I'm going to let them keep debating. I'm going to learn as much as I can from all of them and try to come to a place where I understand deeper tomorrow than I do today. Okay, But scholars have been debating for such a long time as to whether or not that phrase, and fasting, is actually a part of the original texts or not. Okay, It's plentiful in a lot of texts, but numerically isn't as good as accurately. Okay? And so I'm not going to go off on some you know, diatribe here about texts and Texas Receptus and, and all of these other things. I'm just simply going to say this. Your NIV and maybe some other translations do not include the word and fasting on the end of it. Here's where I want us to land on this today to get the idea. Whether or not and fasting was a part of that or not. I think the, I think what Jesus is saying and what we're trying to discover still stands. Because there was a level of prayer that the disciples had not yet encountered, that they had not yet developed, that they had not yet engaged in, and they were falling short of being able to see this guy have a breakthrough and be set free from the grip of the enemy. Okay? And, and, and I believe when we come together in a time of prayer and fasting, again, prayer has to be a part of that. We are engaging in a deeper and stronger level of prayer than our normal prayer times. Okay? Does, it, does that make sense? And so I believe here, whether or not they really were fasting, there was a heightened level of prayer that most likely meant they were that they needed to have been praying and prayed up so well that they probably had been praying long enough to not eat for a while. Okay, hope that translates. If not, please come talk to me later. I'd be happy to have that conversation. Um, with you. If you're online, drop a comment. We'll, uh, we'll engage with you that way as well. But we can have freedom from the strongholds of the enemy through times of intentional prayer and fasting. So church, it's 21 days that we're embarking as we begin the year 2024. I know it's going to make me sound like a cheerleader. I, I, I don't mean it in that way at all. But I truly believe that 2024 is the year that the Holy Spirit of God wants to get a hold of this church and do a new thing. Something that's never been done. Not a better version of the past. Not, not some polished version of, 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 a, of a church down the road that's doing it quote unquote better. No, I believe God wants to do a new thing in the life of this church. And I think he's picked this time. But to see if we will meet him where he already is. So I have a quote from Andrew Murray I want to share it. It says, we must begin to believe that God, in the mystery of prayer and fasting, has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and bring its power down to earth. Marsha, would you just leave that up for a little bit? I appreciate that, because I, I want those who are, who are taking notes to be able to write it down. Um, I also want that to cement in us. We must begin to believe that God, in the mystery of prayer and fasting, has entrusted us, has given it to us. It's ours to behold. Has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and bring its power down to earth. Do you want Jesus to do In your life, you want Jesus to do a new thing in this church, 
We want Jesus to do a new thing in the world all around us. See, when, when, when Jesus does a new thing because his people humbled themselves before him and they, they, they craved him more than anything else, they sought after him and his presence and his power and his guidance above everything else. When Jesus does a new thing, lives are transformed. Generations are transformed. Entire cities are transformed when Jesus does a new thing. And I want Jesus to do something new. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the old thing. I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of, of, of trying to make things work that don't work. I, I, I'm tired of, of trying to do things in my own power or because the latest book told me that this is how it should be done. I want Jesus to show up. I want Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit to sweep in with a brand new and fresh anointing. I want the power of the Almighty God to blow through our lives and through our churches to bring about a transformation that makes His name great. I want Jesus to do a new thing. Because you see, when Jesus does a new thing, the altars at the church, at the front, they're full. The altars of the church are full because the Holy Spirit of God has blown in through the doors and all of the dust on the altars blows away because people are experiencing the presence of God and they are humbling themselves before Him because they want to encounter Christ. They want to be obedient to the, to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Church, i I, I got to just confess and tell you today, I was talking to a, a pastor friend just the other day who made the comment in passing as we were back and forth on this Zoom thing and talking about, yeah, the, the altar's at the front. Nobody uses those anymore. And it wasn't a, oh man, nobody in my church uses them anymore. It was an entire method, if you will. Nobody uses those things anymore. Church, may I submit to us that that's part of our problem? May I submit that for God's people to have left the altar, that just maybe it's us. And that God wants to redeem them. That God is at his altars waiting for his people. When God does a new thing, that's what it looks like. When God does a new thing, church, worship, it, it's not about music. It's not about preferences. It's not dull and it's not boring. And, and it's not hurry up and get to the good part of the sermon. It's none of that. Worship, when Jesus does a new thing, is a group of God's people coming together who are so on fire Monday through Saturday that they can't contain their excitement when they come together on Sunday morning. They can't sing loud enough. They can't celebrate Jesus enough. They can't wait to tell all of their friends not about what they got going on this week, not about the last football game, but about Jesus Christ and what he's doing. When Jesus does a new thing, church, that's what it will begin to look like. I believe when Jesus does a new thing, marriages are healed and restored. I believe when Jesus does a new thing, relationships that, that, that the world said will be broken forever can be healed and restored. I believe that when Jesus does a new thing, the racial reconciliation that is so desperately needed in this country today will sweep in and actually come to fruition. Not because we tried harder, but because we got out of the way. And we knelt at Jesus in repentance. And we said, Lord Jesus, only you. And he says, I know, watch this. That's the new thing that Jesus wants to do. I believe when Jesus does a new thing in this church, salvations and baptisms will become a regular occurrence. 
I, I believe that when Jesus does a new thing here, <laughs> I believe this, that you'll ask me in the lobby, hey, we didn't have a baptism today. Is everything okay? I believe that's what Jesus wants to do in the life of his church. Church, I believe that reaching the next generations with the gospel of Jesus Christ will become priority and will become the thing we're passionate about when Jesus does a new thing. Church, can, 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 I, can I just be frank with you today? Are we, are we tired yet? Are we frustrated enough yet? Are we sad enough yet? Are our hearts broken enough yet as this body of Christ? If 20 years have gone by where we have said, where are the young people? All the while our city grows and grows and grows and grows. They're not absent, they're just not here. Will we humble ourselves and say, maybe it's us? Will we allow God to do a new thing in us and in this church in order that the next generations would know? So that when our students and Marshall aren't the only ones there. But we do a new thing for the next generations. Because that's what we want from Jesus. Because that's what Jesus wants. Will we be willing to do a new thing? Church, new things means finances aren't a problem. Because Jesus is doing a new thing. He's the one that provides it all anyway. Facilities aren't a problem. Jesus is providing it all. He's doing a new thing. He's never going to take us to a place that he's not going to provide for it. See, this is the new thing we're looking for. Or are we? Do we believe that Jesus is speaking to us in this moment, for this period of time, to say, that you keep getting stuck on let me do a new thing I can change all of that if you will humble yourself before me that's what this time of 21 days is all about so what new thing does God want to do in your life in the lives of your loved ones you know those kids and those grandkids and the great grandkids that are far from the Lord right now haven't stepped foot in the church in 10, 15, 20, 40 years are we gonna are we gonna fall on our faces before God and say, Lord Jesus, do a new thing. Do a new thing. In the lives of our community, our homeless population grows and grows and grows. Lord Jesus, will you do a new thing? What about the world around us? What about our church? What new thing does God want to do? You're invited to be a part of this 21 days. Not because we needed to fill a calendar with an event, but because we're desperately seeking the face of God. And we believe he wants to do something in us and through us that have never been seen before. I'm going to invite Cole and Cameron to make their way up. And they're going to be singing a song and you're going to hear multiple times throughout this 21 days. Because we really think it's conveying the message of what we want God to do and what he needs to do. And so as, as they sing, as, as they play, I want to invite you to have a time of some, some quiet reflection. What is God asking you to fast for? What new thing is God inviting you to step into? And church, I'm going to be bold enough today to ask you to come to the altar.
It's not a magical place, it's a humbling place. It's a place where we show the body of Christ that we are responding in obedience to the Lord's leading. And it's a place where we find Jesus in an even more intimate way. I get it, not everybody can kneel down. You can pray in the front row too. But please take this time. Seek the Lord. Listen for his voice. Respond to the new thing he wants to do in your life. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, for honest, we really don't know what to say in this moment. sacrifice all that it takes for you. Help us, Lord, to die to ourselves. Help us, Lord, to lean on your strength in the midst of our discomfort. Help us, Lord, to see what you would have us to see. submission and surrender to the new thing that you want to do. Lord Jesus, break our hearts for what we choose. Challenge us. Grow us. And be with us, we pray. In these 21 days. May the transformation Start now and last till the ages roll. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Be friendly with our loved ones. Come home and pray. Don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. We're all friends and family here. Meet Jesus what he wants to do in you. Thank you.
Just want to let everybody know that. But today, 4 o'clock, students, 6th to 12th grade, uh, they are encouraged and welcome to be uh, in this place. Jason, are you going to embarrass them or make them messy today? Maybe a little bit of both. Good, good. That's, that's, that warms the, the cockles of my heart. Uh, that's, that's so good. All right. But yes, tonight, six, uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, also, um, later on today, um, don't ask me what time, but just later on today, um, you will be, um, most of you will be receiving uh, an online survey. I say most of you uh, because uh, there, there are a few questions that you really can't answer if you haven't been here for at least a little bit of time. Uh, but anyway, there's going to be an email coming out that will have a link on it to a survey. We're guessing it will take you about 15 minutes to take the survey. Uh, most of it are just checking uh, answers. There's a couple where you'll need to type out a response. Um, but we are taking this survey because we want to hear from you and we want to understand at a greater and a deeper level of where we are uh, with, uh, with some things as a church 
And so we're going to be taking all of this information that you share, which, by the way, is anonymous. Um, okay, so you can answer honestly. In fact, please do. There's nothing worse than when, when church people fill out a survey with answers that they think people want to hear because they don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Right? Well, then that means we don't get honest feedback and we can't understand what's going on. So it's anonymous. You can answer in that way. We want you to. We're going to take all that information from your responses and just take it and look at it uh, at the end of January, the beginning of February, and say, hey, this is what we see. This is where people are. These are some, some things we're doing well and some things that we can improve upon. So in your email, it's going to be coming. Uh, a link. It's from me. It's okay. Click it. Simple. If you get stuck, if you ask your grandkids, right, call me. Do whatever you need to do. Uh, but it's, taking the survey really is important for us. Um, also, some of you have an email address that is shared uh, with a husband and a wife, um, and you both need to take it. So once one of you finishes it, the other one can still use the same link again. It's, it's again, it's an anonymous survey, so uh, the second person can also take it. Uh, wives, please don't answer for your husbands and vice versa. Okay, um, but but take the time uh, between now and the end of January to do this survey for us. We really would um, appreciate your feedback and look forward to hearing um, what all you have to say. And then uh, for the 21 days. Marshall is going to be again making his way to the back um, of the sanctuary because he didn't have enough to do today, so I volunteered him for something else. Uh, but he is going to be back there. He has a, a prayer and fasting guide for you, a booklet. And, and it's, uh, we're going to give every adult and every person in here one, right? Um, husbands, wives, you don't have to share. In fact, we don't want you to share because we want you to wrestle with some of the things yourself. Uh, we want you to be able to mark it up and jot down notes and thoughts that the Lord's leading you to um, at, on your own. And so we have a plenty there. If we need more, we will make more. Um, but we have a guide for you today. Also know that on our social media feed, um, each day, in fact, it already went up today, 7 o'clock every day, there will be a new daily devotion uh, during the 21 days of prayer and fasting that you'll be able to find on our website, okay? Fellowshiplincoln.com, 21 days. You can't miss it. A banner will pop up, and if you miss the banner, get glasses, and then click where it says 21 days, okay? Because the banner's going to be at the top of the page. You can't miss it. Um, but on the 21 days page of our website, every day is going to be a new daily devotional. There are 21 prayer prompts. They're in your guide, but you can also download that off the website. You can, in fact, download the whole guide off of the website. 21 fellowshiplincolncom slash 21 days. It's all going to be there. And if you are on our social media uh, feeds, that daily devotional will be posted there every day at 7 o'clock as well. So you can participate that way. All right? Are you overwhelmed at the moment? I feel overwhelmed. I feel sad that I overwhelmed you at the same time. So would you stand to your feet, church? Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Because I believe the Lord was speaking to you and wanted you here in this place today. Thank you for getting out of bed and going through all that you have to do to get to this place. It truly is appreciated. We love you. and We're excited for this 21 days. However we might come alongside you and help, whatever questions you might have, please come find me. We're here for you. Jennifer and I will be at the Welcome Center for anyone that needs us and would like to say hello. We're, we're uh, happy to do that. But church, know that we have a message of hope and that we have a message from Jesus Christ who says he can do a new thing when everything else seems impossible. Take that message with you today throughout this week and share it with those you love the most. Church, you're loved in this mess. God bless.